everyone. It's a um, particular pleasure for me to uh, introduce our speaker today. Um, uh, Summer Bishop is a psychologist and associate professor and a member of the STAR program at UCSF. Um, she comes to us with a, a very distinguished pedigree, um, entirely maize and blue. Uh, for those of you who are uh, Michigan fans, which is about three of you, um, I would say the senior Michigan person is John Sikorsky, uh, but uh, sitting over there. Which, um, but she completed her undergraduate and graduate training at the University of Michigan, uh, receiving her PhD in clinical psychology, uh, and then staying on as a postdoctoral fellow in the uh, UMAC program, the autism program with Kathy Lord, a friend and colleague of many of us. And then moving on to the very distinguished uh, Wasteman Center at the University of Wisconsin, where she did another postdoc uh, uh, in an extraordinary place. Um, before moving on to her first faculty position at the University of Cincinnati, then gradually uh, working her way east, uh, further east to uh, CADB or the autism program at uh, Cornell Medical College in White Plains. And then we were lucky enough to uh, coax her to come west, and she has been with us at uh, UCSF in the STAR program. Summer. Um, has had an extraordinary career. Uh, for those in medicine, I'm not so sure this works out so much in psychology, but we, we talk about people who are triple threats. And a triple threat is someone who is excellent in clinical work, excellent in teaching, and excellent in research. And by all measure, Summer is a triple threat. She um, is a remarkable clinician for those of you who have ever had a chance to work with her or to watch her. She's one of the most talented people I've ever seen work with children and families with uh, autism and neurodevelopmental disorders in particular, but she's talented across the board uh, from a uh, scientific point of view. she's published more than 50 papers. She's uh, had multiple grants, including a current R01 on the development of instruments to measure um, uh, social uh, communication in people with neurodevelopmental disorders, a really critical area of work, but on multiple other grants, for, including genetics, imaging, um, we can go down the list. And uh, as a teacher, she's absolutely extraordinary. She, amongst uh, many things, she runs the training course in the ADOS and ADI here. And for those of you who have witnessed that, she is absolutely amazing. Uh, but you don't have to take my word for it. People come from all over the world to sit in the classes with Summer uh, and to be her student. So triple threat, by all measure, she meets the criteria. There's only one problem with that, and that is triple threat suggests something dangerous or threatening or uh, painful, and summer is anything but that. Um, so I don't know what we could change threat to, but she's uh, triple awesome. Uh, along with being one of the sweetest, kindest people you'll ever have a chance to work with. And I'm not only pleased to introduce her, but to call her a friend and colleague. And I can assure you, you will see all three of her awesome powers displayed this morning, Summer. <laughs> Thank you, that was very nice. <sighs> I'm nervous, I, um, I'm excited to be here, but I'm, 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 I feel a lot of pressure talking to people that I respect so much, so thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about social communication, and my mentor told me that when you give grand rounds that um, especially in the morning, you should just show lots of videos. So <laughs> I am going to show you lots of videos. And um, I'm also happy to talk, uh, take questions anytime if people want to interrupt me. That is perfectly fine. Um, I am an author on the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, second edition, which I'm not going to talk too much about today, but I receive um, royalties for 
publication of the protocols and manual, and um, all of the uh, royalties related to my own clinical work or research or training activities are donated to charity, and UCSF knows about this relationship. Okay. So, um, so just briefly, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk to you about social communication, which is something that I obsess over, um, and hopefully you will obsess over it with me after we're done here. Um, I'm very interested in measurement, so I'm going to talk to you about measurement challenges, considerations, and opportunities, and in particular, talking about the impact of developmental variables. So when we're measuring social communication, we like to think that we're actually measuring social communication and not something else, um, but we have a lot of developmental confounds to deal with. Um, also, I'll talk about uh, the difference between diagnostic and outcome measures um, and uh, some strategies that, that we're working on in our group for moving forward despite measurement challenges. Okay, so um, this is a video of my firstborn at six weeks old and... <laughs> Ooh. All right, so there's at six weeks. Here is at three months. <laughs> and then here she is with her younger sister. So she's four and a half, and the new baby is seven weeks old here. my children are brilliant and amazing, but it turns out that actually most children are that brilliant and amazing. So these are, um, these are new data out of the um, Norwegian um, mother and child birth cohort. And, um, and you can see that when we look at these basic social communication skills, so smiling, responding to somebody's voice, um, interest in other kids, facial expressions, that the vast majority of babies attain these things by way well before 18 months. Um, and that in fact a really tiny percentage um, attains them even late um, or, or not at all. I mean this goes up to 36 months. But um, what's amazing about these skills too is that even in the face of really significant other problems, um, so severe intellectual disability, um, we still see capacities uh, for basic social communication. So this video is, um, this is of a child who came to us earlier this year with Rett syndrome, which is a devastating neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, she is three and a half years old, but she has cognitive abilities at about a four to five month old level. So, I mean, she is profoundly intellectually disabled. Um, she cannot walk. She cannot grasp objects because of her syndrome. And this is her interacting with her dad and with um, Tara Rooney, who is our speech, wonderful speech pathologist. Let's try one more time, and then you want to blow it? Ush! Blow it, make it a little So here is this, um, I mean, this, this preschooler, she should be able to have by three and a half conversations and peer relationships and be thinking about other people's feelings and have all these higher um, level social communication skills that she's unable to develop at this point because her cognitive ability is so, so low. Um, but she has things, she has things that, that we, that we have as infants. Um, she's, she's um, intentionally communicating, she's smiling, she's responding to the important people in her world. 
And, um, and so when we don't see these basic capacities for social communication, it really raises red flags. Um, and we start to think about, um, is a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder appropriate? Um, and I think that the reason that, that, I mean, that we all, that it's so striking is because these, these skills really are present from very, very early on. And so ASD is defined by persistent deficits in social communication. And I want to focus on that word deficits because the diagnostic criteria are really organized around the absence of these things that should be present in typical development. So we have two um, main categories of behavior. One is the presence of things that shouldn't be there, so restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. But the social communication deficits come in as sort of the negative symptoms. So what should, what should be there that isn't there? Um, and that's really tricky to measure the absence of something um, because it's the absence of something compared to what. And that's, that's what I want to focus on um, for much of this talk is who are we comparing um, the absence to? Okay. So... Indeed, when you look at um, kids who go on to have an autism diagnosis, early on they're showing lack of appropriate gaze, lack of warm, joyful expressions, lack of sharing interest or enjoyment. Some things um, are not specific to ASD, but are common to children who show any kind of developmental delay or neurodevelopmental disorders. So you might see lack of pointing or lack of playing with toys or lack of response to contextual cues, and it could indicate that there is an autism spectrum disorder that's kind of emerging or that's onsetting, um, or it could be some other kind of neurodevelopmental disorder. But what's interesting is that even by preschool, you start to see differentiations within particular type of neurodevelopmental disorder so that the kids with autism are clearly sticking out as having particular deficits in social communication, which is not surprising because that is how this, this syndrome or disorder or condition or whatever you want to call it is defined. Um, so here we see... Um, just developmental skill attainment and the timing and um, oh, I think oh there it goes okay so here are months down here and by 13, 14, 15 months we see a separation in kids these are the typically developing kids so they're attaining all of these skills this is number of skills and they sealing out pretty quickly by 20 months because they can do everything um, but then here, PDD-NOS, which is the old mild autism um, uh, under DSM-4, and then uh, autism down here, and DD right here, so kids with language delays or intellectual disabilities, this is where the groups are separating, even at a young age, because the kids with autism are so particularly deficient in, um, in social communication. So as a result of this, what's happened is that measurement of social communication has really been owned by autism as a field. Um, and that's, that's good in the sense that I think people who study autism think a lot about social communication. But it's bad because it means that measure development has really concentrated on screening and diagnosis without a whole lot of attention to the, the, the full range of possibilities. So thinking about social communication as a dimensional construct and that we all have strengths and difficulties in our social, social communication skills. And most of what's been developed has been um, for the goal of saying, oh, you are okay and you're not okay. And there's a lot of there's a lot in between okay and not okay, um, I think, as we would all agree, interacting with people in the world. Um, so we have a number of tools that are designed to evaluate social communication, but they haven't really been developed to quantify severity of impairment within a group that has social communication problems or to measure change over time within an individual. Um, but then at the same time as this measure development has been happening, we have an increased interest in dimension, dimensional measurement of social communication, and so this is just the RDOC definition of social communication. So it is an identified construct under RDOC. And we have a dynamic process that includes both receptive and productive aspects used for exchange of socially relevant information. It's essential for the integration and maintenance of the individual in the social environment. The construct is reciprocal and interactive. 
blah, blah, blah. They appear very early in life. So here we have the, the, the construct of social communication, but we have a set of measures that have been designed for screening and diagnostic purposes rather than for measuring something dimensionally. And this creates a real problem in my opinion. Um, because what's happened in the absence of appropriate measures is that the diagnostic measures have still been applied to do what they were not intended to do. So as awareness grows, I mean clinically and in research, that social problems are indeed not unique to ASD, we have these standardized instruments extended to a very broad range of clinical populations. So it's not unusual to see things that were developed to identify kids with autism applied to populations with, um, with severe behavior disorders or personality disorders or schizophrenia or, I mean, any number of psychiatric disorders that may or may not share, you know, meaningful overlap either in behavior or etiology with autism. Um, but the fact is that these instruments were not designed for these populations, and so we have to be careful about interpreting the results. Um, and even within ASD, we are seeing an increasingly changing landscape towards kids um, and adults with milder symptoms. And, um, and this just shows you, this is from Chris Gilberg's group, but I think this is interesting because this shows you basically kind of average autism symptom scores. Um, by year of diagnosis, and this is age of diagnosis, and particularly for this group of 7 to 12-year-olds, we see the, the symptoms going down um, by year of diagnosis. And so uh, we, have a, we have broadening criteria, which I think is useful on the one hand to really capture kids with more mild deficits who, who have ASD. Um, but it also means that, that autism is just a diagnosis that's kind of up for grabs for lots of people. And, um, and these, these instruments are being applied to them, maybe without full attention to how they work or don't work as well in different groups. Um, in research, there's been a lot of um, effort to understand uh, prevalence rates of ASD in specific genetic syndromes, and I think this is motivated by multiple things. I mean, the cynical viewpoint is that there's been a lot of money for autism research, and so it's a way to, um, I mean, it's another road to funding um, for some groups, and particularly, I mean, with some of these rare syndromes, it's been incredibly difficult to get money to study them, um, and it's important to understand them too because when we have a behavioral disorder that is linked to a known etiology, it just opens the door as far as understanding um, underlying mechanisms for some of these behaviors. But we've also been seeing increasingly um, measures, autism diagnostic measures, being used to study relationships between um, ASD, specific ASD symptoms and these other um, variables. And a problem with this work is that the groups that are being compared often differ significantly on other variables. So here is where you're trying to measure differences in social communication, but if you're comparing apples to oranges in the first place, it might get you into trouble. So, um, so one of the things that I, at the Wasteman Center actually, that really piqued my interest was that I was seeing kids with Fragile X Syndrome, which I'll talk more about in a second, and the kids with Fragile X Syndrome typically have IQs between you know, 40 to 60. Um, so mild to moderate intellectual disability. And many of the kids with Fragile X Syndrome who were diagnosed with autism, they looked like kids with quote unquote high functioning autism. And, and but high functioning autism, I mean it's a misnomer because it's high functioning only in the sense that you have a higher IQ. Um, but you can't have high functioning autism with an IQ of 40. Um, it, it, it doesn't really work that way. And so, um, and so the problem is, is that if we're expecting perfect social skills out of somebody with an IQ of 40, we're expecting too much because by definition, intellectual disability is, is associated with difficulties in the social arena as well as the cognitive arena and daily living skills and, I mean, across the board. Um, so when we take autism diagnostic instruments and apply them to these different populations, we have to be careful to make sure that the groups that we are comparing um, are equivalent in, in another sense as well or in other ways. Okay, so, um, so some of the work that I've been interested in doing is understanding how individual characteristics um, 
uh, we see in autism, we see tremendous variability in neurodevelopmental disorders. We see tremendous variability on multiple phenotypic domains. And so my one, one of my questions has been how do individual characteristics um, affect scores on ASD diagnostic instruments or measures of social communication more generally? And um, so I'm going to show you a couple slides um, from this sample. So you can see that, the, that we had um, mostly uh, pretty smart school age kids, so you know, low average IQ to average IQ. Um, and when you look at specificity, so the ability of the autism diagnostic tool to um, correctly capture children with intellectual disability, you see huge problems with specificity. So this means that 73% um, of kids with intellectual disability without autism meet cutoffs on the SRS, which is the social responsiveness scale. Um, which is not totally surprising because the SRS is trying to capture social problems. And many kids with, with, with intellectual disability have social problems. The problem is if we start calling all of these kids autism, um, then that's not really, I mean, that's not really true, at least according to their, their clinical diagnosis. Okay, then the ADI, which is a parent interview, we see similar problems with specificity here in the intellectual disability group. And then, um, and then the ADOS is somewhat less susceptible, but what's important to know about the ADOS, so it's a direct observation tool, and um, it has modules. So, um, so children are administered a module depending on their language level. And what's important about that is that the types of behaviors that we're assessing for children without speech are different than the types of behaviors that we're assessing for children with fluent speech. And amazingly, both of these to some extent, I mean, more so the SRS, but many, many parent report tools for autism don't actually treat you any differently if you talk or if you don't talk. So, if you've got a kid who doesn't have conversation because they can't talk, that's different than a kid who doesn't have conversation because they are terrible at conversation. Um, and our scores are not making that, that distinction. If we look not at IQ, but at other kinds of emotional behavioral problems as measured by the CBCL in this case, we see big problems. Um, oh, sorry, these parent report are measured by the CBCL. This is um, directly observed behavior problems. And here's where the ADOS takes a big dive in specificity, is that if the kid's throwing a chair across the room, it affects their social interaction. Um, if a kid's yelling at you and swearing at you or ignoring you or hiding under the table, they're not going to be rated as highly in terms of their um, social ability or social reciprocity. But these are other behaviors that are not specific to autism and that are not necessarily what we're thinking about when we're talking about social communication ability that still really interfere with an instrument's ability to correctly classify somebody as having a primary social communication deficit or not. Um, so one of the good things is that these, these, um, these confounds, if you will, these behavior problems in IQ, they show similar associations in groups of children with ASD and non-ASD diagnoses. Um, so they're, so they're, they're increasing the sensitivity when you're talking about kids. They're driving up scores regardless of your diagnostic group. So you could imagine a situation where you're adjusting cutoffs to increase diagnostic accuracy of instruments. But often we don't know what the diagnostic designation is beforehand, um, or we don't know what your level of, um, what your level of these other uh, traits is beforehand. We're just trying to look at everybody together and assess social communication. So in the, in the ECHO studies, which I know many people are involved in, there have been a lot of discussions about what measures to use. The idea is that we're going to have tens of thousands of kids and we can, look, we can look quantitatively at their social communication skills as compared to, you know, environmental or in relation to environmental exposures or other variables. Um, but if we don't have information about these other things, then we could really be at risk for drawing erroneous conclusions. 
So here, if we separate kids into low behavior problems and high behavior problems at the front end, we see this distinction then between the kids with autism and the kids with these other disorders. It's, you know, there's overlap, but it's, there's clearly a difference. Um, but if you were to look across the board and you didn't know kind of who was low behavior problem, who was high behavior problem, these children with autism with low behavior, pro other behavior problems look identical to the kids without autism and high behavior problems on this measure that purports to measure social communication ability. Okay. So, um, so one thing that I've wondered about is whether we could, um, you know, further refine the broad domain of social communication. If we break it up into smaller subdomains, then we might be able to, at least in certain situations or with certain groups, um, achieve greater specificity or just really achieve greater precision of measurement um, because social communication is such a big thing. And there are lots of different definitions. Um, I mean, if you just look, it also, it also gets, uh, people argue about what social communication um, ability versus what social functioning versus what social skills. So there are multiple ways that we could define this. Um, and we need to know what it is that we're measuring so that we can understand it better. And so this is limited because, I mean, we only have, this is an autism diagnostic measure. And so we only have in here things that are most um, useful for differentiating um, autism from non-autism, and this is particular to module three, so these are kids who are verbally fluent. But what we were able to get here is um, two dimensions, two subdimensions. So one, um, these are really infant or very basic level um, social skills, so descriptive gestures, um, unusual eye contact, facial expressions, and shared enjoyment. And they separated from things that measure more interaction quality. Um, so things that you can tank for a number of reasons besides having autism. So you could flop on conversation because you're distracted, because you're tired, because you have ADHD, because you, I mean, a number of different reasons um, that are either related to your sort of how you are generally or your, your state at that moment. You're less likely to show big deviations here um, if you're just having a bad day um, or if you have something else besides autism. So, um, so these, these two subdomains, I mean, again, I think these are still too big, but it's pointing us toward the idea that we might be able to um, separate the broader domain of social communication into subdomains that are useful for different types of um, measurement activities. A problem, though, here is that is that these are things that get better often in kids with autism um, and other social communication problems as they get older. So just as they are really expected um, in terms of babies and, and toddlers and preschoolers, I mean, most people exhibit these, these abilities all throughout their lives, um, but some people acquire them later. And so if we only look um, here and not here, we lose a lot of those kids um, with very mild problems um, on the autism spectrum or who have just more mild social communication abilities. And, um, but, but here's the deal in terms of um, other uh, behaviors affecting scores on these. Again, not surprisingly, these basic social communication skills are primarily affected by whether you have ASD, um, but interaction quality is affected by your diagnostic status, your IQ, so kids with lower IQ have more impairments in interaction quality and behavior problems, and then repetitive behaviors, which I'm sort of leaving out of the equation today. Okay, so here, I want to show you what um, a little boy with ADHD um, looks like uh, in uh, one of the activities during the ADAS, and um, we'll talk about why his interaction quality score might have been impaired. I want you to teach me how to do something, okay? Okay. All right, listen, listen. I want you to teach me how to brush my teeth, okay? But wait, 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 wait. Look, Jonathan, look, look. Here's your sink. Look. I mean, Hot water. Oh, my gosh, you, you are brushing so fast. Are you washing your whole body? Yeah. Yeah. There's toothpaste all over you. There's toothpaste all over you? 
So he is adorable. That doesn't look like autism to me, at least. Um, but you can see where scores on certain aspects of just you know rating the the ease with which you're able to um, uh, establish and maintain certain kinds of interactions. Um, if she's then trying to have a conversation with him and give him leads that he has to follow, um, and 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 building in that reciprocity where he is really with her, he may struggle in some of those things. Also, he's four, right? So, um, so that's part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, but he, um, but he may be rated uh, as having difficulties in certain areas, not so much those basic social communication skills, but more in the interaction quality. And that's what we saw when we looked at at that whole sample, um, and we're seeing that in other larger samples as well. So. Um, so one of the things when it comes to measuring social communication is that we really have to attend to the saliency of the deficits or of the abilities. And utility of specific symptoms to differentiate um, or really how meaningful something is varies across development. Um, and so like I mentioned, some of these basic social communication skills like eye contact or facial expression may be less relevant to older and or more cognitively able or verbally fluent individuals than they are to younger people. Now many of the adults we see with autism or with primary social communication problems still struggle with these basic aspects of social communication, but sometimes they're able to compensate and develop skills in that area and then you're looking for more subtle manifestations of social communication problems. Um, like my colleague at Northwestern who said that his diagnostic test is that if somebody stands right next to you at the, he's a man, a urinal in the bathroom, instead of doing the one over rule, he said that is a good measure of social communication impairment. I don't know, I've never done that before, but, um, but I thought that was a good example. Or my mentor was talking about how she was in a movie theater in New York, the only one in the whole theater and somebody came and sat down next to her and there were 300 other seats. Um, and that's that's awkward because you know you can't really get up and move, but I'd want to. Um, so this interaction quality or subtle manifestations of um, social communication impairment will be impaired for many younger and or intellectually disabled groups regardless of their diagnosis. So we really need to attend more to the relevance of comparison groups for different purposes and at different developmental levels. And so to ask ourselves who is the appropriate control? And so historically in autism, I mean, you'll read a lot of older papers where the comparison is three-year-olds with autism compared to three-year-olds with Down syndrome compared to three-year-olds with typical development. And I mean, that's useful to include this non-autism um, DD group. But Down syndrome is another syndrome that's, um, that's characterized by you know, mild to moderate intellectual disability. And it's different comparing somebody with an IQ of 50 to somebody with an IQ of 150. And we are increasingly seeing kids with autism who have high IQ. And when you're, and when you're comparing them to people with intellectual disability, they're starting at a different place. Um, and so um, this happens a lot in the work on um, genetic syndromes and ASD. And there's been a lot of kind of momentum and interest, and I think it's very important in trying to link these ASD-related behaviors to underlying biology, and in particular phenotyping individuals with known genetic abnormalities. Um, and what we see is when we apply autism um, diagnostic instruments to pick your genetic syndrome, they yield high rates of ASD. I mean, almost across the board. Um, but identifying suitable matches with autism for the kids with genetic syndromes can be very difficult. Um, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about why that's complicated. So fragile X syndrome is, I mean, it's well known to be um, associated with autism. Uh, depending on the study and the instruments used, you might see that 20% of kids with fragile X have autism, all the way up to 90% of kids with aut or fragile X have autism, and that's very dependent on the methods being used. But here is a consistent finding. So these are kids with fragile X syndrome without ASD. And these are kids with Fragile X syndrome with ASD. And always, across every study, the children who receive diagnoses of ASD have significantly lower IQ. Um, 
And so given what I just showed you about um, the effects of IQ on autism diagnostic instruments and on measures of social communication, uh, we may be seeing an IQ effect here. I don't think that's actually the whole story, but it certainly makes the, the differences between the groups look a lot larger. Um, here's tuberous sclerosis complex, um, which is the same story. Um, here we have blue is typically developing, um, uh, TSC, no ASD is green. Then we have the non-syndromic ASD group, whatever that means at the moment. Um, and then we have the TSC with ASD. And so the kids who have the genetic syndrome and the diagnosis of ASD are always the lowest. And then here is looking at their scores on social communication instruments, and this is the ADOS. And the conclusion from this was, oh look, there's no difference between kids with TSC with ASD and kids with non-syndromic ASD. So that's really the story in a lot of this work, is there's no difference between autism in X syndrome and autism without X syndrome, in part because we really want to sell that so that we can understand, or so that we can we can believe and we can discover how the um, mechanisms implicated in this specific syndrome have applicability to the broader population of kids with ASD. Um, but again, the apples and oranges problem, if these kids with non-syndromic ASD have IQs of 70 or 80 or 100 and the kids with TSC have IQs of 40 or 50, then, um, then they, are, they are already different. Okay, so, so what I'd like to talk about now is just the importance of considering the profile. Um, because social communication skills, just like other things, they don't develop in a vacuum. Um, and in fact, what's important about understanding social communication deficits is how it compares to other domains of development. Because it can't be a deficit if it's not worse than something else. Um, and so from the, from the start, when we're trying to understand social communication deficits, we have to have a baseline and think about what is it lower than, um, what expectation does it violate to be even called um, a deficit. And so this is the last um, video of my child, I promise. Um, but Margot finally just learned to walk, and I was getting worried because the, in some of my work, 15 months for walking is a very important cutoff, and so she was 14 months and a couple days, so we got in just under the wire. Um, and, but here, so one of the things that, that's cool in typical development is that with the onset of walking comes this burst in social communication and language, um, and so these systems when they're going you know, right, they're all going together and they're developing together. Um, and so here, this is the first day of walking. She avoids her sister very skillfully. We've got walking, we've got smiling, we've got communicating, responding to people, and all of this is happening at the same time. Um, and when we're looking at neurodevelopmental disorders associated with social communication impairment, I mean, we're looking to see are there dips, are there, are there peaks and valleys in these different skills as opposed to them kind of all going as they should be. Um, and so deficits and strengths must be defined in relation to other skills. And so just like the little girl with Rett syndrome who I showed you, who actually I think shows a relative strength in her social communication relative to having um, a, a developmental level of four to five months, or at least cognitive level of four to five months. Um, I want to show you a boy with Phelan McDermott syndrome. Um, oopsie. And so he is six and a half, and he has a nonverbal mental age of 17 months. So he has an estimated nonverbal IQ of about 22. So you know he has severe to profo profound intellectual disability, and um, he cannot walk, and that's a big deal too. You know, for for exploring the social world, for being able to interact with people, when you can't hold things, reach for things, when you can't walk. So motor development is not um, inconsequential here. But here is Bryce. Today is Dean's birthday. 
looking at her, he's smiling at her, he's trying to communicate with her. He has no um, verbal uh, language. I mean, he doesn't, he's not able to talk. Um, that was his nonverbal mental age. His verbal mental age is lower than six months. Um, so he doesn't really understand very much, um, can't say anything. Um, but he's doing what he can um, for communication in that moment. And I mean, he doesn't look like um, a six and a half year old, typical six and a half year old in terms of his social communication ability. And he doesn't look like a typical 17 month old either in terms of his social communication ability. But if you think about his level of impairment in other areas, um, social communication, at least to me, appears to be a relative strength. So if we're comparing him to a child with ASD, who's a seven-year-old with ASD, this is a seven-year-old with ASD with, um, oh, sorry, he's got an IQ of about 110. And this is our seven-year-old with ASD with primary social communication. These guys are so fun. Are they? Just... I, and I also saw they had a little um, girl play sets. Oh, they do they have, have girl play They have little rooms and... Um, Which is Jillian awesome. That's her name, Jillian? Uh, yeah, and I mean J I L L Y. We have it. Okay. The, um, Jillian. Girl, but we don't have the house. And also it comes with um, like a little baby stroller. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, it's a little wobble ball, which they call it's really a mini ball, where they push it around. So I'll speak you because that goes on for about another two hours. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. And then he comes in and he starts talking about the Zuzu pets. Because that goes on for about another eight minutes. And he's talking about the Zuzu pets. And, um, and he has, I mean, he's, he's very cute, he's very verbal, he's very bright, um, and he's able to talk about his particular interests. He has a really hard time when the examiner tries to bring it back to her or even get a word in. Um, and so, but he is a completely different story from the seven-year-old that I showed you, Bryce, um, who is nonverbal and who has very, very low IQ. And so, but if you were to compare them, if you were comp to compare Bryce with Phelan McDermott syndrome and an IQ of, you know, 20, to Daniel with autism and an IQ of 100, Bryce is going to look worse on all of our autism instruments. And so another thing to come out of this comparative work has been basically the kids with the syndromes look a lot worse than the kids, the genetic syndromes look a lot worse than the kids without the genetic syndromes. But here I think is someone who's a more appropriate control for somebody like Bryce. And this is Peter, and he has autism. He does not have an identified genetic syndrome. Um, his nonverbal mental age is similar, so it's about 20 months. And he's a little bit younger. He's five. But this is him. Today is baby's birthday. He's engaged in repetitive play with the plate, and um, he's not making eye contact or attending to the activity or to the social interaction. Um, and so he, I'm guessing, would look less good um, compared to, you know, compared to Bryce. Um, but they are more appropriate controls. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is figure out how we can access um, 
uh, large data resources to identify appropriate controls for some of this work so that we can truly understand what the relative profiles are um, between kids with um, different diagnostic designations um, or different kind of etiological um, explanations for their social communication problems. And this is a study that was done last year, um, or published last year, with a bunch of people who are here. And, um, and it's, so Stefan Sanders and Matt State and colleagues have, have identified a number of genes that are um, uh, associated with ASD with high confidence. Um, and so we looked for um, children in um, the Simon Simplex collection, so kids who had a de novo loss of function or de novo CNV in or including one of these regions. And we matched them to kids who had no identifiable um, abnormalities in these areas. Um, I mean, they could be subsequently determined to have um, meaningful mutations. Um, but at the, at the moment that this, was, that this matching was done, they didn't. Um, and we matched them on um, age and sex and IQ. And so you can see that we've got one-to-one -one matches, and they are very closely matched on age. This is age in months, and on IQ. And their, their mean IQ, both of these groups are much um, uh, lower than the overall Simon Simplex collection, again, because one of the things that we know about genetic syndromes or, or you know, big genetic hits is that it is the first thing, one of the first things it does is pulls down your IQ. Um, and so these kids have uh, lower cognitive ability, although they're not, you know, it's not 20, but it's, um, there's a big standard deviation, and gen many of them have intellectual disability. And so when we look at their, um, their scores across domains, what we see is that the kids with the de novo mutations, and I should have said too, sorry, these are, kids are all taken from um, a genetics, um, or sorry, uh, an autism genetics and phenotypic data consortium. So they all have a clinical diagnosis of autism. Um, but what differentiates them um, for the matching here is whether or not they had a, a, a mutation in a specific area that was believed to be significant. So the kids with, um, with autism who have a de novo mutation, those are in the, the dotted line. And the solid line are their matches. And their profiles were differentiated in a number of areas. So first, the kids who have um, a de novo mutation walk at a significantly later age than the kids who, um, who didn't. And what I think, one of the things that is, is most interesting to me about autism is, I mean, we can think about it as how much goes wrong, right, that's supposed to be there. So you see these infant social skills that are not developing as they should be. But really, I like to think about it as how much goes right. I mean, it's amazing that these kids, they walk, they many talk, they can do all sorts of things and then there's this clear you know, hole in something that is so basic to so many kids, even with these other really significant disabilities. Um, so age of walking and motor skills in general from other papers seem to be differentiating the children who have these rare genetic hits with autism from those who don't. And that's consistent with what we've seen in the genetic syndrome literature forever. Also, the kids with the de novo mutations had relatively better language abilities than the kids with autism. Um, sorry, they all have autism. Than the kids without the de novo mutations. Um, and then they had relatively milder parent-reported autism symptoms as well. So what's cool about this is that when you look at the whole group, when you look at kids with a rare genetic mutation compared to a whole group of kids with autism who don't have rare genetic mutations, they look worse across the board. They have lower IQ, they have worse autism symptoms, they have more seizures, they have motor problems, on and on and on and on. And, but, a, but part of the reason that their autism looks worse is because they're starting with less to begin with. So they really have significantly lower cognitive abilities than the whole autism group. Um, so, and clinicians were less sure that these children had um, ASD, the ones with the de novo mutations, as compared to the other ones. So there's something about their clinical presentation that also seems more mild to the clinicians. 
So just to um, uh, sum up this study, so more delayed onset of walking, relatively less severe language and social communication deficits um, as a group uh, characterized the kids with the de novo mutations. But we only saw these profile differences um, when we really carefully matched the two groups. Um, and so I think that you know, we, can, we can try to regress out things like age and IQ and other things after the fact, um, but sometimes that can be difficult just because of the degree of variability within the populations. Um, so I like this approach, at least for getting us started, for understanding relative strengths and weaknesses um, in different um, syndrome groups, in different diagnostic groups, um, and attending to some of these paradoxical aspects of ASD. So in particular, you know, why is motor development so intact? even when social communication is so impaired, I think it may, may help us, may help move us forward. <clears throat> so, you know, we have these behavioral symptoms that exist on a continua. And, um, and that's clear with social communication. And so we need to get away from descriptions of absolute deficits. And that's hard because it's so a part of our, uh, of our um, diagnostic language. Um, but where, where I think we're really stalled is trying to use categorical measures at this point for dimensional measurement, and it's not working. So, so we're trying to apply things that we've learned to really identifying kids with a particular diagnosis and then say, let's use these across the board and, and, and collect more dimensional um, information, but what we really need is different measures to be able to do this. And in particular, it's a, it's a travesty for treatment studies because um, treatment studies in autism, I and mean, this is something that people don't talk a whole lot about, but we actually don't show changes in core autism symptoms. So we can show changes in irritability, we can show changes in language, we can even show changes in IQ, which is sort of contrary to the whole idea of the construct of IQ. Um, but we can't show changes in social communication symptoms for the most part, um, in particular because we're so focused on capturing deficits. And so it's hard to show change. You were really deficient at point A, but you're not quite so deficient at point B. So we really need to flip this and think instead about ability and skill attainment. Um, and so, um, so the grant that I'm working on now that has uh, just started, well, we're coming to the end of year one. Um, and so maybe next time I talk, I'll have a new measure to show you. Um, but this is a multi-site effort um, uh, to try to develop a social communication abilities measure for children, not just with autism, um, but with neurodevelopmental disorders generally. Um, because that's the other big, big problem is that we've just gotten way too stuck in our one little disorder, um, and we need to think about social communication as being something that's relevant to every person. Um, so we named it, that's the progress we've made so far. Um, it's the Developmental Assessment of Social Communication Abilities, or the DASCA, and it's intended to facilitate within and between group comparisons and assess individual level change. And so we're going to norm it within specific developmental cells based on age and um, haven't quite decided whether it'll be IQ. So we're able to make use of um, some online IQ measurements so that this could be done, um, it would be more feasible than having to require a, a, an in-person IQ test and, and, and bin people by that. Um, but we may end up using some combination of that and language level to try to figure out how we can assess social communication um, in a person relative to his or her appropriate controls. Um, so when we're thinking about your level of social communication ability, we need to think about you and these other things that are important for understanding your social communication ability. So your age and your cognitive ability and your language, um, and then measure your skills rather than your impairment. So what, what is exciting about this is the ability to identify both high and low scorers because right now we have just major, um, you know, however you want to flip a ceiling or floor effects, depending on whether you're thinking of them as good or bad, on the autism measures because you just don't score if you don't have autism, but that doesn't really show any gradient within the high range or the good range of ability. And so we want this to function a little bit more like IQ or adaptive behavior in terms of being able to show gradient in a normal population as well. Um, and it's going to be computer adaptive and built using an IRT approach. Um, 
And so hopefully that will help us, um, but we really need to think just in, in measurement of social communication, understanding that this is affected by multiple factors and being really open about the limitations of current measurement tools and strategies. It doesn't mean that we can't use what we've got because we have to use what we've got, but we should at least be forthcoming about where it might be problematic to interpret um, some of the findings. Um, and particularly in, in comparison, in selecting comparison groups to do so thoughtfully um, and, and know um, who we're comparing to whom. But I think in the long run, you know, using trajectories as phenotypes, um, identifying phenotypes that are less susceptible to, to developmental confounds, so like either using um, aspects of early history to try to think about um, subgrouping kids or phenotyping kids, or having measures, hopefully like the DASCA someday, that actively account for developmental variables in measurement will be really critical for linking um, behavior to biology and understanding the mechanisms that underlie some of these symptoms that we see. So thank you very much, and um, I'm happy to take questions. Steve. So that was uh, fantastic. And what I really like is this idea of going nomothetic when you need to have the mean level comparison to the right contrast group but going ideographic to look for uh, a cross-trajectory change. But tell me more about what the, quote, right contrast groups are. So you took, at the very end, you talked about de novo mutations, and that these kids have worse motor skills, but relatively more inconsistent or somewhat better social communication skills. Is the right contrast group other kids with that exact CMV, or is it... How do you get the nomothetic part to make the ideographic part work? Well, I think the, so. So increasingly, as I see kids with with major motor problems, I'm thrown for a loop, actually, because um, so so I would I would tend to say that the most important variable is is basic cognitive ability. So if we can match group with whatever going on to this group on cognitive ability and age, though, it's got to be both um, because because 15 year olds are really different from two year olds. Um, and and even 15-year-olds with IQs of 20 have had 15 years of life, right? Um, so I mean, there have been. This is not a new problem, uh, but but I think the the motor piece is is really tricky too because when kids don't have the ability to, first of all, you can't even assess their cognition in a in in a, the right way or in a valid way. Um, but it just it changes everything. Um, even in terms of what you can expect for social communication. So I think we have a lot of problems. Where I'm thinking about starting this is trying to at least deal with cognitive ability and language and age. And if we can match on those things and understand, so part of the effort of this year has been getting together um, a data set of you know, 15,000 kids with um, mostly with autism but with other things and trying to see if we look within narrow developmental cells which social communication skills show the most variability because that's really key because we're sort of missing those, those really fine grain differences and any of those kids, I mean I can say Bryce has a strength but he clearly has impairments across the board. It's only when we really dissect that and see look he's looking and social smile and communicative intent and the problem is with our measures too is that those things wouldn't even be asked of him anymore because he's not nine months. Um, so part of the issue is that with our tools, like even the Vineland, is that they is that the basal rules mess it up because we're not asking the things before that are really relevant. Yeah. Back. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for an illuminating talk. Well, the uh, conclusions that you reached several times about the search paradigm limitations and obstacles are the same ones in the study of the adult of personality dimensions in psychiatric syndromes. And um, so uh, there are certain things that, like especially our research track, residents can draw from your conclusions, uh, which is um, it went from autism 
ASD. I would say, even in slides, it would be better to say ASD small x, because there's a, it became a spectrum uh -huh. because of dimensionality rather than <coughs> the earlier paradigmatic expectation of categorical rigidity. Uh -huh. and, um, and then longitudinal measurement Absolutely essential, but costly and complicated, and uh, needs larger grant. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what's needed. The, uh, the third thing is the um, uh, limitation on um, uh, control groups. And I would suggest stopping using the word control group. And I think what you suggested verbally is much better contrast comparison mm -hmm. probably more than one. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yeah, right, right. And and more than one to account for just these different dimensions because they don't all exist. The perfect comparison doesn't all exist necessarily in the same group, to Steve's point too. I, I just one comment and that's the I mean, actually I have to throw what Marty said to Steve as well of what we're comparing to, maybe we need to go back and stop limiting ourselves to uh, IQ or age. And what we've been doing recently is these kids who are just different and, <laughs> and who don't fit in any category, who are probably the most important ones to help us, but trying to articulate as clearly as we can what is different about them, both in terms of their strengths and weaknesses, and maybe think about different dimensions and following them longitudinally because it's just it's this it's it is the profile over time that's going to answer that question yeah i agree yeah. yes so back to um one of the points you were talking about not matching to a control group which is a misnomer but it's right of three people but matching on the appropriate variables what are your best thoughts about kids with pretty serious motor deficits getting an IQ score. <laughs> um, so some of the kids with some of the most serious motor deficits um, would be inappropriate for most of our normed test tests anyways. Um, there are people who really have um, uh, specific, relatively specific motor deficits. Um, and I think we're, I think we can use certain nonverbal tests as at least a, a general proxy for that aspect of, but then there's a point at which, I mean, if you can't, I mean, if you can't even track or if you, then, then we're really stuck. And, but I think one thing about that group is that because of the complications, they have been excluded from almost every study of social communication. And so one of the things that we're at least trying to do here is if we can describe differentiations at this very low end of cognitive ability, um, then, I, then I feel like we'll at least learn something. I don't know if we'll be able to do it, but, but to bring them back into the folds and include kids with known syndromes, with motor deficits, um, and understand their their social communication strengths, I think will it'll be moving forward, I hope. So just to press a little bit, yes. this isn't a seminar assessment, but I've been warned that a lot of so-called nonverbal IQ tests aren't very good in yeah. terms of quote IQ. Yeah. So what, what are you, what's your uh, initial uh, bag of tricks, what do you think of? For nonverbal IQ? Yeah. So it depends on the, I mean, we so we still rely a lot with really low kids. We rely a lot on the Mullen. Um, which you know is normed in 1995 and never going to be renormed because the person went to an island and is apparently not making tests anymore. Um, but um, that's that's my dream. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No. No. So so I think so so some of these developmental tests like that um, for very low kids. And then I mean all these new. The other thing is that new additions are just flying off the shelves here out into the world. And so we tried the. Um, the Ravens two the other day, and got like a 35 point discrepancy between that and the matrices from the uh, WISC, which is a little disconcerting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so so part of this, so I think yes, yeah, so cognitive um, assessment is in, is embedded in 
in this, we have to at least be able to do a pretty good job at estimating somebody's overall bin. So maybe it's not, so if we think in terms of mental age, I guess, nonverbal mental age, and, and I think probably there's a, there's a maximum at which it doesn't matter so much anymore, but looking within the lower end at mental ages may help. I, one other thing that I'm just sitting here and thinking about is that we're talking about ASD and neurodevelopmental disorders. And now, at least from my perspective, virtually every psychiatric disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder. But, uh, but I think when we, if there, we have plenty of patients who don't have NDDs who have uh, problems with social communication. And, um, and, and maybe using some of this in a broader group of individuals, not just schizophrenia, but we have patients with mood and anxiety disorders or borderline personality disorder who clearly have social communication problems and thinking about how this dimension Yeah, no, I think that's the, that's the whole point, too, is that if, we, that if we think about it as just another dimension that we're able to really assess dimensionally, then that would all be in a group of, say, you know, adolescents or adults with pretty average IQ, right, and to look at that as the same way um, that we could look at adaptive behavior domains. I mean, this is one domain of adaptive behavior, but we're trying to develop something that's more nuanced than our current um, Vineland socialization, but it may just be a better Vineland socialization, and that'll move us in the right direction. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you.